if I and many of my colleagues had come earlier and invested all our energy here, there would still have been the killings because the killings already started, right? Uh, but maybe we will have forced or compelled the world powers, particularly the United States, to intervene early. The horror of seeing the beautiful sunrise over the lake and turning around and seeing just stacks of bodies inside the church. The brain had trouble adjusting to that. But we can make pain less unbearable and give people a chance to live meaningful lives. Yeah. And I, I believe that that's what this country is trying to do from everything that I have seen. Mm. Hello there. My guest this week on the Long Form Podcast is Dele Olojede, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, editor, and publisher. Dele was the first ever African-born journalist to win the Pulitzer Prize, U.S. journalist's highest prize for journalists. He won the Pulitzer Prize for a series of articles that he wrote in 2004 about the aftermath of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Hello there. Before we dive into today's conversation, have you subscribed to our channel yet? If you haven't, do so. And remember to share your thoughts with us in the comments below and like this video. Your support means a lot. Now let's get into it. Dele, welcome to the long form. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a special pleasure to be back in Kigali. Yes. Uh... Which uh, I've come to repeatedly over the past 30 years. Yeah. And each time with a renewed sense of wonder mm. and uh, quite uh, extraordinary how human beings can dig themselves out of a massive hole mm. and become something special. So I like coming here. I love the people here. When, when was the first time you were here? This will be uh, in 1994. I, at that time, I was the Africa Bureau Chief for New York Newsday. I had flown in from New York two years earlier to set up our Africa Bureau for the first time. Mm. Since Mandela had come out of prison, everybody knew apartheid was going to end. So I was covering the transition from apartheid to democracy. Mm. And so uh, in April of 94, uh, the campaigns were in high gear in South Africa. Mandela was running for president. De Clark was running for president. Mangosutu Butelezi, the Zulu chief, was running for president. The whole country was excited. Mm. They are going to have majority rule at last, right? Mm. And I was covering this campaign. And then we began to hear news of some killings going on mm. in the Great Lakes. And it was kind of in Rwanda. It wasn't clear whether this is another of the periodic massacres that had happened here, mm. uh, or whether this was something else entirely. So it took a while before it was clear that it was something else. Uh, besides, the eyes of the world were all focused on South Africa. Mm. This extraordinary story of the end of white rule on African soil, mm. and the rise of Mandela, and the ANC, and all the heroic people who had brought the, peep, the country to that stage. Uh, so there wasn't a particular burning desire or urgency to shift the gaze to Rwanda and what was happening here. Mm. So almost all of the world's correspondents had descended on South Africa at the uh, time. I read somewhere where you mm. said that you had a choice mm -hmm. of either being in mm. South Africa or coming to Rwanda. And Correct. you obviously chose uh, South Africa at the mm -hmm. moment mm. at the time. And you also uh, commented and said that maybe if you had come to do journalistic work here and report the story, that maybe the events of 1994 would have not transpired the same way. Do you still feel that way? Yes, because we... So our work is very interesting as journalists. You know that yourself. That we may be doing this work, which is, you know, it's a self-selecting tribe of people who want to somehow feel that they can make the needle move in society. And occasionally, when we're lucky, our work can actually cause good things to happen. Mm. So we occasionally have the evidence that our work 
can stop evil sometimes, mm. can bring some measure of justice and so on. Uh, so I will give the example of a colleague of mine uh, at New York Newsday, roughly a couple of years earlier than we were talking yeah. about, uh, during the Bosnian War, and the Serbs were raping the Muslim women and so on. Uh, Radogan, Rad, Radogan Karacic was the, was the warlord for the Serbs who uh, was organizing the rape of all these women. One of my colleagues broke that story. Now, up until that time, the Clinton administration was dead set against intervention mm. in the Balkans. But it became so embarrassing to not do anything so they started the bombing campaign, stopped the Serbs and so on, mm. and put an end to that. So journalism, not all the time, but occasionally, can cause good things to happen mm. and stop bad things from happening or minimize their happening. So it is objectively true, although not guaranteed, that if I and many of my colleagues had come earlier and invested all our energy here, there will still have been the killings because the killings already started, right? Uh, but maybe we will have forced or compelled the world powers, particularly the United States, to intervene early mm. and limit the number of victims. Well, but, but that didn't happen. Now, it's almost a theoretical exercise because you can't say that one thing will lead to the other. We also have many examples where Things have been covered incessantly and, and nothing Gaza happened. Gaza is a case in point. Right. right. So, pardon? Gaza is a case yeah, in point. Yeah, right, right. But even Gaza, is, there is now a kind of response because the U.S. government is now threatening Israel with ending you know, military and other diplomatic support if they don't do the ceasefire, right? Because Biden is now under pressure. Why is that? Because not only traditional media, but all these young people on TikTok, wherever, sharing videos and so on. So it's not possible to keep it hidden. Mm. But in 1994, things could still be kept relatively hidden unless we descended here mm. and made it clear. When I was in Somalia in 1991-92, covering the, the famine there in which so many people were dying, it was our reporting uh, mine and the reporting of so many of my uh, professional colleagues from other media organizations that caused President George H.W. Bush to eventually send the Navy SEALs yeah. to intervene and they stopped Mohammed Farah did and they started putting aid there and people started being cared for in Somalia. Mm. You might have remembered the, even, the night landing of the SEALs on Mogadishu Beach. I was on the beach that very night as the, as the navies came ashore and all the camera lights were flashing and so on. So me, uh, the, the eyes of the world, when trained on something, often can provoke a reaction. It may be late in coming. It may not happen instantly, but invariably it does. Mm. And that's the reason I said that I kind of been at the back of my mind that if I'd abandoned South Africa at that moment and come here, and many of my colleagues, if they had done the same, maybe 800,000, 1 million people will not be dead. Who knows? Maybe by death, 100,000, the armies of the world will be in here stopping the genocide mm. from happening. We don't know that. But the thought occurred to me. Yeah. I, I was looking through your, uh, if you're a musician, it would have been called your disco, disc, discography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your albums. Yes. <laughs> and um, I really saw your name around 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the year that you won, you were the first African, born in Africa, mm -hmm. to win uh, a Pulitzer Prize right. uh, for some of the reporting um, that you did mm -hmm. uh, around 10 years after genocide. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel the need to come back and do those stories? Uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, the first was I was in a position to do so. So that's kind of like the baseline. Mm. Because I was the foreign editor, 
I directed all of the paper's foreign reporting. Uh -huh. So I was at liberty to assign myself to something that I cared passionately about. Why did you care so passionately about a small, an African. African, a, a small African country? Yeah, it's African people here mm -hmm. who are dying. Yeah. I'm an African. I was born in Nigeria. I was educated there. I started my career there long before I moved to America, like almost 40 years ago, uh, where, after which I went to grad school uh, in America. I started my career in Nigeria 42 years ago. I was educated at the University of Lagos. Now I got my master's degree at Columbia University years later, but I was already fully formed. Mm. So I am of this continent, and if an African is dying somewhere, it bothers me. That's my, I mean, any human being being killed bothers me. I am particularly bothered when Africans are being killed. Mm. So thinking that one might be in a position where you might lessen the suffering of people. Mm. I mean, this is true for me anyway, whether I'm in China or Vietnam or Somalia or wherever. But this was particularly galling for me because I felt I was in a position to have helped earlier on and didn't mm. because I was so obsessed with South Africa and the end of white minority rule after 300 years of black people being subjugated there uh, and so on. Uh, I wanted to witness that and record it for the world. Mm. So I was obsessed about South Africa at the time. And I think that blinded me to the urgency of what was happening in Rwanda. Mm. Because remember, whether it was Burundi or Rwanda or Congo and so on, there has been a long period of periodic violence in the region, uh, a few thousand, two thousand killed, mm. one thousand killed, whatever. And there was a sense of being a little jaded because earlier on we didn't know Africans that, kill themselves every so often. Yeah, particularly the region, yeah. right? So in weighing something, and I'm saying this frankly because it's not easy to admit it, but I'm saying it frankly because that factored into the thinking, right? Yeah, this was not news. It wasn't like special, new, original. Mm -hmm. uh, it is regrettable, tragic, but on the scale of it, apartheid is over. Mm. It didn't match up. And at that time, remember, nobody knew the scale of the killings and what it would become. Because yeah. this started on April 7, right? Mm -hmm. So for the first two weeks or so, and in part because only a very few correspondents even showed up here at all, and for fleeting moments. So that made it impossible to know the scale of what was to come. But quickly, I think, within weeks, it was clear that this is not just your average Friday night massacre that has happened. Remember, in, in Rwanda itself, whether it was 59, the 62, or 63, 72, 72 so there have been this where in Burundi, Congo is have these upheavals, and so on. So I'm using this as an explanation, not a justification to see how people process information. Now, it's 30 years and I'm still feeling guilty that I wish that I had processed it differently because I do believe, and it may be a kind of conceit, but I do believe that one, having certain skills of narration, of reporting, of doggedness when you care about something, uh, you could have moved people to act mm. if you were here on time. So there is no question that for me, that was probably not the most optimal decision when you weigh whether large numbers of people are uh, at risk of being killed and were in fact being killed versus uh, the effective end of apartheid, right? So to, it's a long way of answering your question about why do I care so much of, about the place? So since that time, and I only got here uh, shortly after Mandela's inauguration. Mandela was sworn in as president on May 10. So I'd satisfied myself, I've now seen this thing. Uh, election was April 27 in South Africa, Mandela inaugurated May 10. It was only after that that I got on a plane and came to Rwanda. Yeah. By that time, uh, genocide was at least 50%, if not more, 
of, 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 on its way to its final destination of all these people being killed. And uh, so the period I was here at that time, I believe it was late May, how did 1994. You get, how did you get here? Because it's not as if... Uh... You just fly to Kigali Airport, no. You fly to Nairobi, you jump on a, you know, an aid plane, whether a UN World Food Program plane or, you know, medicine some frontier. The, the civil war is still yeah. happening. Then. Yeah, it is happening, yeah. So, I mean, you know, we've covered wars Who's before. giving you visas? <laughs> That's funny. There is no visa. You, you just show up. There is no visa. By then, the government was collapsing. Exactly. Because the RPF now knew that these people were trying to wipe people out, so they accelerate their attacks, mm -hmm. right? So RPF, by the time I got here, were already in parts of Kigali. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Hotel Diplomat, there was already a unit there and so on, and a few other places. So you come in behind them because they were the guys stopping the genocide, and then you gain access to other things. That's usually the I, I, I want, but I actually, I think sometimes we don't get enough chances to talk to people like you mm. who have actually done this. So bear with us, okay. bear with me. So you get to Nairobi, then you fly in a UN aircraft? So I don't remember which one it was, but typically this is how it happens. Mm. If it's a difficult area to get mm. to. Yes, because we only have one airport, right. it's Kanombe. Right, and, and uh, it's just not safe, obviously. Mm. There is no such thing as a visa, the government had yes. collapsed. Uh, that a hot war was going on. Mm. So typically what you do is you will have already uh, on your way to Nairobi, mm. uh, some may have gone through Dar es Salaam or wherever, mm -hmm. uh, on your way you will have made contact, say, with RPF representatives in Nairobi mm. to announce yourself that you're coming. Mm. You will have made contact with various uh, NGOs who are active mm. in the area, Medicines and Frontier, but most prominently UN agencies like World Food Program. Uh, if remnants of the UN peacekeeping force were still here, mm. you get in touch with General Delaire's office and so on. Mm. That's how you kind of uh -huh. figure your way as safely as possible yeah. into the place. Mm. And so by shortly after I got here, the uh, regime, the Hutu power regime, was now in full flight. They'd withdrawn from Kigali. Kigali. Mm. Then we camped at Hotel Milkalin mm. and started covering. And, you know, this place was quite, we can get to that, but the place that I found, once you've seen that, you cannot unsee it, right? So anyway, the government had kept shifting, and by this time, I think they were in Gisenyi or some... At that, that time, place. they might have moved to Gitarama. Gitarama or... first, and then from Gitarama, mm. they went to Gisenyi and then fled into Goma. Mm. So in fact, the, when, when the big surge of people was crossing into Goma from Gisenyi, mm. I was right at that border post, mm. over 48 hours, where two million people essentially pell-mell fled into Goma and into those camps. Mm. And it's quite a sight to behold to see two million people on the march. When, when you landed here in Kigali, did your intelligence gathering, did your, the people that you had talked to, mm. did that, did that pre whatever they had told you, whatever you had found, you know, found out, whatever images you had seen, mm. <clears throat> did it prepare you for the devastation on the ground. Oh, no, 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 nothing could prepare you for it. Nothing could prepare you for it. I mean, for the first thing you notice, other than gunfire in the distance where pockets of fighting were still going on in Kigali, but most of the fighting has moved to Gitarama and to, on, on the way to Gisenyi, right? But there were still pockets of fighting on various hills, and you, you hear the rat -ta -ta of machine gun fire and the boom of the occasional grenade or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that was not what caught your attention. What your, caught your attention was the absolute silence of the country. Mm. And I drove around a lot mm. in areas that were no longer controlled by the then, then government. Mm. It was silence. No roadblocks? No. no. So there were roadblocks by troops, but they were letting us through 
uh, RPF soldiers. Ah, so the, right. you did not, if there were no inter Hamway roadblocks. No, no, no. The inter Hamway were fleeing with the government mm -hmm. and, and, and terrorizing the population commune by commune, salu by salu, to live with them, mm. right? Which is how they then reorganized themselves in the camps. Mm. So this country was just silent. Mm. You could not hear a dog barking. And that was very strange. That was the first thing I noticed. Mm. Because you could describe Kigali and other towns as a, a, a necropolis, the city of just the dead. Mm. There was just dead bodies everywhere, in wells, in the rivers, in banana groves, on the roadside, in churches. It's frightening. I was in Kibuye. One night, I got in too late. Uh, it was dusk like this. And I had gone to interview some local people. And then the only place I could stay in that night was inside the Roman Catholic Church in Kibuye. Mm -hmm. They had some kind of bungalow that was like a guest house. It was right on the edge of the lake, as I remember. It was very late. So I went in quickly. They gave me a room. And I went to sleep. So in the morning, I woke up, and the sun was coming over Lake Kivu. And I thought, how beautiful. So I stood outside my room, looking at the lake and the sun rising. This would be about 5.30 in the morning. And then I turned around. I hadn't seen this. Remember, I came in the dark mm. and saw the church. And some of the windows were blown open. And I just saw through the windows Stacks of dead bodies floor to ceiling in a cathedral in Kibuye. The horror of seeing the beautiful sunrise over the lake and turning around and seeing just stacks of bodies inside a church. Mm. The brain had trouble adjusting to that. So that's what I mean by once you've seen things that you saw here, you cannot unsee them. Yeah. Then you left, came back 10 years after. No. No? I was back in 96, mm. did another series of stories. Then I was posted to China from mm. Africa, from South Africa, to become the Asia Bureau Chief in Beijing. So I was gone from 96 to 99. Mm. And then from Beijing, when my posting ended, I returned to New York and became foreign editor. Mm. And that was the work I was doing when the 10th anniversary came around. Mm. Because then, you know, I was directing wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq, mm. and so very busy. Yes. And then it was suddenly 2003, I said, oh, I was going to use uh, a newsroom uh, <laughs> coinage, which may not be appropriate for your, for your audience. Basically, I was saying, holy cow, this Next year, April, is 10th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So, and since it was within my power to assign myself, mm -hmm. I then decided early January of 2004, I will encamp here in Rwanda for the next four months. Mm -hmm. Because I thought that 10 years now give us, it's an artificial construct, of course, to say it's the 10th anniversary. But at least it refocused the mind in a way that 10 years is long enough time for you to gain perspective of what had happened here. You know, when it was going on, you were just doing one thing after the other, right? You are reporting, this has happened, this is what I saw, and so on. Mm -hmm. the, the, the International Criminal Court is just getting started, uh, arguments over the UN and what they did and didn't do. You were just busy with sort of daily you know, hard tackling of what's going on. Mm -hmm. But if time passes and you've been able to reflect, you gain some perspective on the immensity of what has happened here. And I thought that that was a good time mm. to return here and just go deep to figure out, so to answer some big questions that I was asking myself before I left New York. One was, how does a country come back from the dead? Mm. Right? This country was dead, right? Most of the population was engaged directly or indirectly in killing 
a significant part of the population. And then another big chunk of the population had fled into the neighboring countries. I mean, this place was dead, mm. which, which makes it all the more extraordinary to be in Rwanda of today, 30 years later, and see the extraordinary recovery and progress that has happened here is uh, one of the great human achievements mm. in my view, given where you were coming from. So the 10th, uh, so 2004 for me was just to try to answer some of those questions, including how might justice be possible when you have a perfect crime? Mm. A perfect crime being when the objective was so comprehensively successful of wiping out people and that in the doing so, at least the majority of the population was culpable. Mm. Is that any more a crime? How do you apply justice in such uh, a thoroughly executed uh, 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 assassination of large numbers of people. And so the question of how does justice manifest in such an, an environment, an extremity, because it's not an everyday occurrence. So remember, Rwanda has, and maybe still has, capital punishment for murder. No, not anymore. No, but at that time. At that, that time it did. Yeah. yeah. So are you going to sentence 60% of the population to death? or however the percentage who either killed directly or facilitated the killing, pointing out who was hiding and so on, in, 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 in uh, murder uh, trials, the facilitator as well as the executor, Accessories. Are, are, they are guilty. Mm. So that's an impossibility, obviously. You're not going to apply such a law. Hence, gachacha, and hence a little bit of international criminal uh, court focusing on ring leaders, Rwanda itself trying to focus on the top 1,000 of the perpetrators and let everybody else go home. I was in a lot of the prisons interviewing the people who were there then before most of them were emptied and people sent home, uh, including this woman who was uh, the voice on Radio Milk Colleen, Bemeriki, Valerie. I went to see her in prison in a flamingo pink uniform to try to understand why do you, how did you as a human being get to that? Because that to me was still an unanswered question, mm. right? So the 10, 10 years passage gave you the perspective to be able to think in this large about these large questions of justice and its near impossibility of uh, coming back from the dead, of people, when a place has been so morally uh, devastated, right? Where a teacher gives off the pupil, the priest gives off the parishioner, right? The, the, the wife gives off the, the, the husband. Dad. So there is a moral collapse in a universe where that happens because that's not how we human beings normally behave. So how do people stitch back together their moral universe was one of the things I was interested in, right? Is, is it even possible? And if so, what is, how long will it take for that to happen? And by coming to Rwanda at that time in 2004, was to begin to see whether there are signs of where the country may go along these questions. 2004, um, the story that people remember the most about the series I did then, about this woman and her son. I'd like to actually talk about that. Okay. Um, because one, among the, so I, I, just before this interview, I kind of went through the series of stories that actually won you the Pulitzer Prize, mm -hmm. story by story. And among the stories that you highlighted were the effects of the mass rapes mm -hmm. that took place uh, during the 1994 during the genocide. genocide against mm -hmm. the Tutsi and the children that were born as a result of a the result violation. Of yeah. Yes. I wanted to ask you, why did you choose to highlight that particular angle of among all the different things that happened during the genocide? So there is something intimate 
in my view, about uh, an act of rape, particularly in the context of its being so impersonal. Right? Uh, it's almost like a weapon mm. to destroy the will of a population. The Serbians did that to the Muslim women there, and it was definitely done here. You know, we're going to kill all the people we want to kill, and the ones we didn't kill, we're going to have some fun with them and rape them. Mm. There's something, it, it, it's a, a different level of violation, and uh, other than actually being killed, that may be the worst kind of suffering because there is no escaping it for the rest of your life, mm. right? So I was interested in using that as a way of exploring, as a standing for the wider society, this internal interior conflict between a woman who was so savagely mass raped, right? And then being forced to carry the baby to town. So now witness, this boy is now nine years old. Another thing I was saying about perspective. Now, if I talked to the woman at the time, it would be a different story. It would still be an important story, but it's not the same story because there would be no way to explore how the relationship between mother and son is evolving and how they're struggling with it, mm. right? And so I chose that instrument as a way of understanding how in millions of homes in Rwanda, people are going through this internal struggle, whether it's as a result of rape itself or something else, mm -hmm. or where a spouse has given up the other spouse, where the extended family is now broken, how people stitching that together. Mm -hmm. So by focusing on this woman, and you know, there were people in Avega who helped me a lot to find uh, the appropriate candidates for this exploration. Uh, and we tried a few before I, I saw this woman, I immediately I knew this is the woman whose story is going to illuminate the kind of horrific suffering that people have gone through and how they are struggling daily to try and transcend it, to try and overcome it. For those who so that's haven't it. Mm -hmm. uh, read the article. Just yeah. give us a small synopsis. So this 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 woman, uh, Alfonsina Mutuze, uh, all her family had been killed during the genocide. She was working at some factory on the outskirts of mm -hmm. Kigali. Uh, the family had been wiped out. And in the rush of people trying to escape into Goma, paradoxically the same route that the genocidias took, on her way to try and escape from Kigali, where everybody was just being killed, the Interahamwe captured her at the checkpoint. So they started raping her and passing her along. And then you, uh, that was as they too were escaping as the RPF was pushing. Yeah. And they all ended up in the camp in Goma, where they were using her effectively as a sex slave and forcing her to carry the pregnancy. She tried to drown herself. She did all kinds of things. Anyway, carry this baby to town. Now, you have to understand one thing about this woman. She's the only survivor in her family. And the only family she now has left on earth is the product of the rape from the people who wiped out her family. Yeah. Now, that is being dealt a hand that is impossible to imagine. Right? That's what happened to her. So uh, it's not a surprise to me that people almost don't remember the other stories, however important they were, except this one. Because through a single individual struggles, you can, you can come to an understanding of very large things. And that was, uh, I can never forget her. Uh, in fact, before I leave town, I will still try and reach out to see if I can uh, see her to just say hello and see how she's doing. Yeah. Uh, because to me, that story illustrated the struggle of Ru Rwanda to repair itself yeah. against impossible odds. Uh, would you like to partner with us here at The Long Form? If you do, you can send an email to us 
at longformwanda at gmail.com. Partner with us and become part of Wanda's most exciting and in-depth podcast. I was going to ask you if mm. you had seen her since 2004. We have been in touch. Mm. And when I came uh, in 2019 for the 25th anniversary of the genocide, I made a serious effort to, to, to uh, reach her uh, and use people in Navega to, uh, but she was gun shy about reopening these wounds from her past because my understanding is that she's now married mm. and uh, she had a big falling out with her son mm. who is now presumably uh, in his late 20s mm. and eventually I was told after she had become married to this person uh, eventually slowly reconciled with her son. Mm. I don't know where they are now in that relationship and it's something that is very interesting to me that I would like to reconnect with her. Mm. So I'm seeing our intermediary from 2004 on Monday uh, to ask her to reach out to this lady and find if she has a change of mind about meeting up. Because in 2019, quite understandably, you have now struggled for so many years and uh, reaching a certain level of peace and stability, uh, people are not necessarily interested in revisiting this kind of horror. Right, so I gave her a space then. Uh, I will keep trying to reach out to her. And if she finds herself in the place where she thinks she wants to reconnect, I would like to take the temperature again to see where mm. she is. Because I, mm. I remember I was reading the story and, and mm. I remember just how, I, I think there was trauma, on, obviously trauma on both sides. Oh, totally. You know, on, she on, was unspeakable. She, you know, her, this son of hers is just a constant reminder of Of our trauma. Pain. Yes. And yes. this poor boy is also just saying, you're my mom. Yeah. I want love from you. And it's not my fault that this happened. Mm. Right? It was not a fault of his. So you now have two people in an impossible situation. Mm. You can even begin to imagine psychologically how somebody can cope with that kind of thing. Mm. I mean, I think that's that that tells of the strength of Rwandan women. Yes, and Rwandan uh, society and country mm. that there were all this. So there was an Abega event yesterday, the launch of the book and so on. Uh, people who have gone to extraordinary lengths to try and do the work of repair that needs to be done. They may not be fully successful because some of these things cannot be repaired. Mm. That's just, you know, let's be realistic about human nature. But you can lessen the pain and make life bearable. Mm. And I think if we limit ourselves to that ambition, we might achieve that. Mm. We can't achieve repair, in my view. Mm. But we can make pain less unbearable and give people a chance to live meaningful lives. Yeah. And I, I believe that that's what this country is trying to do from everything that I have seen. Mm. Not because you can repair the past, but, you, but that you can make the future livable. Yeah. Yeah. You, you traveled, uh, among the series of stories again, you traveled to uh, uh, Sovu mm -hmm. in uh, present day Huye district. At that time it was right. still called Butare. Right. To a uh, monastery, or is it a nunnery? Yes. Nunnery. Yes. yes. Uh, and you were reporting on, you know, uh, the role of the Catholic Church. Yes, and, and the, the, the grand effect, betrayer. Yes. And, the, and the effects of genocide within the nuns' community right. of, that, of that area. Right. And I, I found it so interesting because you were, you were now touching on matters of faith. Mm -hmm. What, from your reporting, what did you learn about the intersectionality between faith, how people deal with trauma, genocide, betrayal, and all those things? Mm. What, 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 did you, uh, what did you learn? 
I think the most tragic thing about that story, which happened all over Rwanda. Do you want to take us through the story just quickly? So, that so I went to Sovu to this uh, uh, monastery uh, where the sisters uh, and, you know, they, they, they'd been there. These are people who have more faith than you and me, mm. right? They dedicated their own lives to the service of Christ in their faith, in their church under the guidance of uh, Sister Superior, Mother Superior, and you had novices and nuns and so on. So this is their life. They believe, these were believers. Now, I'm a skeptic. So maybe my disappointment would not be, I would still be disappointed if people are betraying human beings to be murdered. But if you are a believer, and that happened to you, it has to shake your faith. Now, but one other interesting thing that I found is that those people still felt they needed the faith in order to survive and to cope with being alive. Remember, a lot of survivors constantly ask themselves, why did they take all my family and only I survive? Why should I have survived? People, and where was God in all of this? Yes. So that was the big question. And it's an eternal question. It's been asked throughout human history. Certainly, you know, every culture has some concept of God. Uh, before the monotheist religions basically took over the world, Islam and Christianity and so on, uh, Judaism uh, took, took over half the world. Um, people have always asked this question at times of great tragedy. So Dostoevsky, the great Russian writer, most of his work was asking this unanswerable question that if God really does exist, why is there so much suffering on earth? Mm. And so Christians kind of wiggle through by saying, you know, faith is the evidence of things unseen and so on. It's not a satisfactory answer because the question Dostoevsky was asking constantly, particularly in Brothers Karamazov, was, if God exists, why this cruelty to children? Now you can understand about adults being cruel to one another. They've eaten the apple, he said. Mm. But the children, they're innocent. They don't. So it details real massive cases of extreme depravity mm. in the treatment of children. Mm. And so the question is, he, and he's having this conversation, he, he sets it up as a, an older brother having a conversation with his younger brother who's a novice, mm. who's followed the path of the faith. The older brother is a skeptic. We presume that to be Dostoevsky himself. He's asking, if God, this is your God that you believe in, if this is what he allows to happen so that there could be some eternal life somewhere else, then I, I happily return the ticket. I don't want to be part of this. Mm. Right? So that question has remained unanswerable. Why? Because God, in almost every faith, has been placed hidden somewhere not within our reach. And he works in so-called mysterious ways. Mm. I am highly skeptical of the whole enterprise. Mm. And when this thing happened to these nuns, who, as the old village funneled into the valley, into this monastery and the church there, because you're seeking safety in the house of God. Mm. That's why it made it so easy for people to be killed at such massive scale in churches throughout Rwanda. Mm. People's instinct is to run to the house of God because you will find safety there. That was the belief. God but will protect you. it concentrated them in killing zones. So it was easier for them to be wiped out there. They were not scattered in the hills and the forest and banana groves. Mm. They're all now in one place. We can kill them all. Mm. And the mother superior who fled to Belgium before she could be made to face justice was the one who summoned the inter and the local militias to come and kill these people. Hence, the devastation and sense of betrayal that the survivors felt 
including one who decided to leave the church entirely. That's the survivors from the nuns. Yes. Mm. One said, I can't undo this church anymore, left. He's no longer a Catholic. The, another one stayed. And that, that's our only way of coping and making sense of what had happened to her and to so many other people mm. there. So these are stories that g provide illumination around how social institutions, civic institutions, uh, that supposedly are to play one kind of role can quickly be deployed to play another. Mm. And this is what happened with Bemeriki herself mm. and the media and Radio Mill Colleen mm. and so on, mm. because they became instruments for mobilizing the population for the killing of fellow citizens. The graves are only half full. Mm -hmm. Who will help us fill them? Those you're actually quoting what she said uh, on radio. On radio at yes. the Radio Libre de Mil, de Mil Colin, yes. uh, H Correct. Radio. Yes. That's actually something that I want to also touch on. You interviewed her. Yes. Uh, and you obviously introduced yourself as a journalist. Mm -hmm. So it was not just journalist and source. It was two journalists talking, talking yes. to each other. Mm. And you obviously had probably listened to oh, of course. her transcript. I've attended Arusha, the old thing. You, you know, no, you didn't are, listen to her yeah, yeah. on radio. Mm. And, and, and the recordings the, are, are mm, kept. Mm. Yeah, yes. What was that experience like for you? So, in a way, let's go back to the nuns, mm. where their church betrayed them. The feeling you get as a journalist when confronting a journalist who has used your profession to mobilize people for mass killing, right, uh, is a feeling, in a way, of betrayer as well. Because remember what I said earlier about journalism and, you know, we, we are a self-selecting group. This is not where you are going to make large amounts of money like Elon Musk. No, this is where your abiding sense of justice and the quest to understand human beings uh, is what propels you into journalism mm. to protect the weak, uh, to hold power accountable, all the things that we find so appealing as young people go into the journalism career. It never occurred to us that the same instrument can be used for the opposite, which is to mobilize a population into killing their neighbors and family members and friends and colleagues and mates, pupils, and so on. Uh, and somebody who did this, and we have incontrovertible evidence because the recordings exist that she did this, uh, is at some level is an act of betrayal. And so I had to steal myself when I went to see her in prison to maintain a certain distance, even though neutrality, of course, was neither possible nor desirable uh, in that situation because there's extremists, shall we say. This is not simply you disagreeing with the political view of somebody who supports Trump or you know, doesn't support uh, Buttelezi or or, or, or Jacob Zuma. This is the killing of the innocent on a mass scale. Yeah. So neutrality or detachment uh, may be neither necessary nor desirable in such a situation. Nevertheless, you know, you're disciplining yourself, you go through the interview. And what I found really was kind of a depraved individual. I met other killers in prison, their flamenco pink uniforms that I spoke to. There was a man who I met in prison and interviewed at length who had said to me that he resisted for two full weeks before he finally succumbed and killed his wife, right? Let's take him at face value that he was telling the truth. But you could sense at least a level of regret in his actions, mm. and he became emotional, and you know, tears were in his eyes. It was too late, you've, you've, you've done this evil thing, 
But for Bemeriki, there was no remorse that I could see. Mm. And in a way, uh, this is kind of akin to the description of the concentration camps as, you know, how banal it felt, the banality of evil. Uh, I just saw her as this really uh, unrepentant person, still trying, obviously lying, because we have the historical record, mm -hmm. and still trying to deny that she did that, or, well, that we were forced or something. You know, it was, it was pathetic because there was no moral repair that was possible with a person like that. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to inform you now that... Uh 20 years since then, uh, she's actually she's actually admitted to her crimes. Uh, Bemeriki? Yes. Wow. Yes. So I guess time... The passage of time. The passage of time kind of gives <laughs> a bit more clarity. Right. And she, presumably she's a lot older yes. than... She's 30 years older than she was yes, when she time. was committing this uh, yes. unspeakable crime. So... We're now, it's good that we're now talking about journalism. Mm. I'd like to ask you, how do you reconcile what happened in Rwanda in 1994 and journalistic ethics like free speech mm -hmm. and, and uh, freedom of the media? Mm. You know, when you think about that, you, you have instances, for example, of uh, there was a time that I think it was Delaire who asked that the U.S. Romeo government, Delaire, yes, yes uh, asks, he asked the U.S. government to jam the, the radio station, the, the radio station, mm -hmm. uh, RTLM, and the Clinton administration refused to, saying mm -hmm. that it they were not sure whether it was within the framework of media freedom <laughs> and freedom of speech. <laughs> so I'd like to. And of course, there's the, what we just spoke about of uh, how uh, Valerie Bemerici was a journalist and was using quote unquote free speech mm -hmm. to push genocide. So I'd like to kind of hear your thoughts on the, those intersectionalities, you know, uh, free speech, hate media, mm -hmm. and human rights. So. It's when people are being disingenuous that they claim to be confused about these things. We have a long history of how we mediate the idea of free speech, which is fundamental to the flourishing of the human being, to where the limits of free speech may be. So we may argue back and forth, but we've had many examples where limiting free speech has been seen as necessary evil to prevent something worse from happening. Mm -hmm. So the famous US Supreme Court justice uh, judgment uh, ruling that says, you have free speech, but you are not free to shout fire in a crowded theater and cause people to panic and stampede and lead people to be, to be killed or injured in the, in the, in the stampede, right? Your, your free speech was limited by that ruling. You have free speech, but you have no free speech to shout fire when there is no fire and mm -hmm. cause a stampede and get people to die, right? That's one thing. Remember, almost in every war, say if you went with the US military or the Israeli military or the Nigerian military, whatever, they censor your report from the war front, right? Nobody claims that free speech is unlimited and therefore you can write anything you want because the reason they do that, may, sometimes the reason is not true, but the reason they usually do that is they don't want you to be giving away the position of their troops if you were to carelessly fire stories about where they want so on. So they limit your free speech in that way, right? Now, uh, libel laws in various countries is another limit on free speech. Free speech is not unlimited and has never been. So it's disingenuous to be uh, talking about free speech as an excuse not to intervene when a public radio station is mobilizing the population to go and kill their neighbors. Mm. So it's disingenuous. We've always had limits on free speech. Free speech is necessary. Free speech is what we're experiencing now, having a conversation. Mm. 
where nobody is telling us that we cannot discuss these issues that we're discussing. But if we begin to say in this interview that now that it's 30 years since the genocide, actually, uh, you know, we should start going to go and kill these Hutus. Then our free speech is gone because that obviously will be a crime mm. to go and be murdering innocent people because you feel like you have the right to say it. So uh, I find it childish to make the argument that free speech is unlimited. It always has been. Even when you restrain yourself as an adult from not saying the first thing that comes to your mind, mm. you are curtailing your own free speech without anybody else saying you should. But because you're an adult, you know that there are certain ways of behaving in public or in interaction with other people. Let's say there's a woman comes in here, maybe it's part of your crew, maybe she's overweight. I'm not free to just say, ah, this woman is so fat, right? So I curtail that as an adult knowing that some kinds of speech are inappropriate, not because it's even against the law. So uh, we spent enough time on that. Free no, speech is bunk if you claim that it's unlimited because it has never been unlimited. So who gets to choose who creates the boundaries of free speech? Because one of the challenges that I have as a journalist uh, practicing here in Rwanda is when I see how outsiders mm how they uh, how they look at my country and our situation as as journalists and then say, I want to impose their own standards and then it. they want to impose their mm -hmm. own standards mm -hmm. uh, or they say you are not free because you cannot do what we do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then what we say is no 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 we have free speech what we avoid is divisionist talk hate speech uh, genocide ret uh, rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And then they say, no, 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 no. You are against free speech. You are the Pulitzer Prize winner mm -hmm. among us two. How would you want someone like me to respond to those who come and point fingers and say, ah, but you're not free. So the, the first thing is that people who have circumspection, who have restraint, all qualities of being an adult, mm -hmm. should not readily point fingers, right? Um, because when you come as an outsider, and even for somebody like me, who has been here repeatedly over the past 30 years and seen what I've seen, I will caution myself to make grand judgments about how Rwandans are uh, handling their own affairs. And the reason for this is when the people were being killed, all the rest of us were going about our merry lives and we did not intervene. And now we feel free to be pointing fingers. I think it's actually, if I were a Rwandan, I would find it offensive. Mm. But it's not always malign, right? The first thing, to be kind to people who may misjudge a situation is, by definition, as an outsider, your scope of understanding of what's going on in a society is limited, right? And the way you exercise moral judgment, and I support this, by the way, is you look at your own experience, and through that framework, you make moral judgments about others. The only thing is that you should not make those judgments frivolously or thoughtlessly. And it's always preferred wherever it's possible to engage people in a collaborative effort, even if you think they need to redefine something. Mm -hmm. So that's one position for me. The second thing is, it is not wrong for people to say, well, 
why are you being stopped from publishing this or, and so on? Because the experience we have throughout the world of authoritarian governments is that it's an instrument of power usually to keep people in their place so that a certain elites can maintain their power. Now, my argument in general is that this is not easily translated to Rwanda, a country that has gone through an extreme trauma. This is not an everyday occurrence. This is not a Bacha planning a coup in Nigeria and we start saying there should be free speech in Nigeria because this guy just planned a coup and took power for himself. This is a place where, what, 12, 13% of the population was exterminated. How do you suppose people react to an event like that from which you can never fully recover despite your best efforts? So because they're going to react differently from you sitting in Paris or sitting in Stellenbosch in my case or whatever and making judgments because your own environment is completely different. So these judgments should be softened by the knowledge of the people having gone through this and are uh, understandably a little jittery that if they are not maintaining eternal vigilance, this thing can easily happen again. This is why I don't judge Rwanda too harshly because when they needed us, we were not there. Mm. And we should be a little circumspect of pronouncing judgments about how Rwandans are handling themselves. That does not mean that as fellow human beings, we should not exercise any moral judgment at all, right? But it should be done with circumspection and softly and with understanding mm. and modesty. Because I think what probably offends many of you is that you see, see people coming at you arrogantly and say, this is the way you must do it and so on and so forth. I suspect that's part of it. Mm. It is not a malign thing to criticize the conduct of a government, including the Rwandan government. But it should be done as much as possible, uh, gently and with an understanding that you are dealing with people who have gone through an extreme trauma and you can't judge them by the same standards that you are judging other societies. Last question. You're here for Kwibu Cup 30. Mm -hmm. You're a, a, an extremely busy man. Why did you choose the need to be here? Why did you feel the need to be here physically at this time? So it's a continuation for me, and I suspect it will happen throughout the rest of my life, mm. that I am very curious about Rwanda's progress, how people are handling things, the more distance they have from the events of 1994, which we should name for what it was. It was genocide. Mm. And the farther they move away from that, it's a fascinating subject for me to see how people are evolving away from that experience and trying to construct a different future. I think it's a powerful uh, story of human endurance and ingenuity in many ways. So that's one reason I come. The other reason is just, it has now become a habit for me that I must show up in Rwanda every other year or so. I was there last year. I was there in 2021 when I came to interview the president. Uh, and I was here in 2019 for the 25th uh, uh, commemoration of the genocide and so on. Uh, so I suspect I will keep doing that. I've developed lots of friendships here. Um, I actually uh, think that in the future, uh, this will not change for me. I will keep showing up. Uh, for Rwanda and for myself because uh, it's an important story and one is lucky uh, to be alive to witness it, how people are trying to stitch back together something that had been so brutally uh, shredded. Yeah. Dele, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Fun. Hope it's you enjoyed a, it. It's a pleasure to be chatting with you and to 
uh, make me bring back all these memories of that year. So thank no, you. No, it's, it's important yeah. to, for the storytellers such as yourself to share those stories with a newer audience, mm. a younger generation. I hope they take far more interest because after all, uh, in constructing their future, they have to have a better understanding of what has happened in this place. So thank, thank you, so you. Thank you for inviting me. If you enjoyed the conversation today, share your thoughts with us on our social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok.